Welcome to the MD Edge Daily News. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, a surprisingly high number of sepsis patients aren't admitted to the hospital. And we hear from Dr. Eileen Benz on female authorship in the Journal of Gastroenterology over the past 40 years. Later, CMS is holding back a key payment to health insurers with big implications for the future of the Affordable Care Act. But we begin with an early look at draft recommendations for managing Sjorgen's syndrome. The recommendations will divide the treatment targets into Sika syndrome and systemic manifestations of the disease. These recommendations are nearing finalization by a ULAR task force. They are pending final review and endorsement by ULAR. Dr. Soledad Retamozo is a rheumatologist at the University of Cordoba in Argentina. She presented the draft recommendations at ULAR 2018. She says it's hard to treat patients with Sika syndrome plus fatigue and pain because there is no high-level evidence on how to do this. The ULAR task force recommendations start with managing oral dryness, which should begin with measuring salivary gland dysfunction. The recommendations also include non-pharmacologic interventions for mild salivary gland dysfunction, followed by pharmacologic stimulation and saliva substitute. The second target for topical treatments is ocular dryness. This starts with artificial tears or ocular gels or ointments. In the case of refractory or severe ocular dryness, ULAR recommends eye drops that contain non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or a glucocorticoid based on controlled study results or autologous serum eye drops, a strategy tested in a randomized trial. With regard to systemic manifestations such as fatigue or pain, the recommendations suggest evaluation of comorbid disease and assessing the severity with standardized tools like the ular sorgen Syndrome Patient Reported Index. You can read more about the recommendations at mdedge.com. More than 16% of emergency department sepsis patients are not admitted to the hospital. This is according to preliminary results from a large retrospective cohort study. Researchers reviewed medical records from more than 12,000 adult ED patients who met criteria for sepsis at two large tertiary hospitals and two community hospitals in Utah between 2013 and 2016. Gastroenterology is still a male-dominated specialty, although women are entering the field at higher and higher rates each year. Female first authorship tripled from 1995 to 2010, and female senior authorship tripled from 2000 to 2010. But these gains have not been equal in all areas. Dr. Eileen Benz presented research at the annual Digestive Disease Week in Washington. The research includes all articles published in the January or July issues of gastroenterology between 1971 and 2010, excluding animal trials. Dr. Benz spoke with MD Edge on her team's research. Trying to explain those differences, uh, why female prevalence of authorship would be much higher in certain areas such as Benz research and epidemiology compared to clinical trials. I don't have a definite answer, but I think partially it might be due that if you're full-time working in clinical gastroenterology and you're trying to do research, there is often no allocated protection time for this. So females who may have other commitments outside of work would just not have this possibility and accessory to do proper and good research. Whereas in other um, types of research, such as Spanish research, um, the research would be much more integrated into your daily uh, activities. And lastly today, officials at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced that they will no longer make adjustment payments to health insurers until litigation is resolved. The announcement has the potential to further destabilize the individual and small group markets created by the Affordable Care Act. The risk adjustment payment essentially shifts money between health plans. 
The government funnels money from plans with a low number of high-cost enrollees into plans who have taken on more of these costly patients. The payments are meant to minimize the risk of adverse selection and spread risk across plans. The government was set to make a payment of more than $10 billion for the 2017 plan year. But agency officials announced that they will put the payments on hold while the issue gets sorted out in the courts. In January, the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts ruled that the payments were allowed. But a U.S. District Court in New Mexico ruled that the government's methodology for determining payments was invalid just a month later. CMS has asked the court in New Mexico to reconsider. Meanwhile, there are other legal battles complicating the Affordable Care Act. The Justice Department recently announced it won't defend the ACA against a lawsuit that claims the individual mandate is unconstitutional. And that wraps up the Wednesday edition of the MD Edge Daily News. Links to these stories are available in the podcast description. For MD Edge, I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Nick Andrews. The MDH Psychcast is all new today, with Dr. Lorenzo Norris welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Strawn to discuss SSRIs versus SNRIs for pediatric patients. You can subscribe to the MDH Psychcast and the MDH Daily News and the MDH Cardiocast wherever podcasts are found.